Welcome everybody as you're joining. Um, my name is Beth and I'm a member of the, of the planning and logistics team for the Climate Emergency Mobilization Task Force. I am so thrilled to be here with these four inspirational leaders um, who to, to the point of our um, presenter earlier today, this um, turning anxiety into action, um, this group of women has really seen a need and created organizations that bring people together to address those needs. Um, so um, I feel really fortunate to be in their company this morning and hear from them. Um, I'd like to introduce briefly our, our four panelists and then they will introduce themselves and describe more about their work. Um, we have Sarah Weber, who is co-founder and executive directory of, uh, director of the Berkeley Food Network. Um, we have Yuka Nagashima, who's the executive director of Food Shift. We have Jackie Nunes, the founder of The Last Plastic Straw um, and the advocacy program manager of the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And we have Lindsay Howell. Hull. Lindsay, I wanna make sure I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. Is it Howell or Hull? It's Hull, like a hole in the ground. Great, thank you. <laughs> we have Lindsay Hull, who's the CEO of Dispatch Goods. Um, so if that, Order sounds good. You can um, jump in and introduce yourselves, and we're so um, happy to have you here. I guess I'm starting. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Beth. Um, so I just wanted to start out by um, reiterating a point that Jackie made when we did some planning for this session, which was that there are entry points into this work, and I really love that concept. And it's kind of interesting when you think about the work I do, which is to provide food to people who are hungry in our community, um, that food banking and food pantry work has for a very long time done work around uh, food recovery that in 1982, the sort of first recognized organization was founded in New York City. Um, and I made a note here, let me see if I can find it. It's called City Harvest. Um, and probably a lot of people have heard about that. And that was my entry into this kind of bigger uh, world of food recovery work was uh, getting involved in food assistance work. So um, just a little bit about my organization and how food recovery fits into it. Um, I started working as a director of a, a medium-sized, I'd say, food pantry in Berkeley and realize that if we're really gonna address such large uh, need for food, so much hunger in our community, that we needed a different kind of model. So what we ended up founding, uh, myself and three other founders, was something that really resembles a food um, resourcing and distribution hub, which is a warehouse that we were very fortunate to get um, from the city of Berkeley. And through that warehouse, we're able to bring in all kinds of food from all kinds of sources. And then we have a number of programs that allow us to get the food out in ways that are much more robust than typical food pantry work. So we provide um, a mobile pantry program. Currently we have 25 partners within the city of Berkeley and Albany. Um, and we love those partnerships because they allow us to really know and understand the people we're feeding better. So we get the right kinds of food to them. Uh, we do it at times and in places that are really convenient for them. And we work really hard to destigmatize the work. So um, our model was working quite well before COVID. Um, we had been doing it for a couple of years. And when COVID hit, um, we, were, we were able to use our model to triple the work we're doing to feed um, going from about 1,600 people a week to feeding about 5,000 people a week. So we're really pleased with that success. Um, and then another thing that we're doing is really thinking about the way we are sourcing food. So right now, we're doing some pretty robust food recovery work. And uh, last month, we uh, recovered 40,000 pounds of food, and we really feel like that's something that we can grow um, over the coming months. And that food goes out to some of our partners in Berkeley who also do food assistance work. So some of that food goes directly to them. Um, some of it goes directly into our own pantry programs. And then we have a hub kitchen program. So we use a kitchen in a building next door to us to make about um, close to a thousand meals 
every week. Uh, each of those meals is individually packaged and then frozen, and we distribute it to our uh, our own clients through our mobile pantries and then an on-site pantry that we operate. But we also give it to a lot of our partners for them to distribute to their clients. So that's that was our way into food recovery. And that's how we're trying to really be creative and expand that work within our own program. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Yuka, would you sure. introduce yourself next? Hi, I'm Yuka. I am the new executive director for Food Shift. I took over Food Shift from the founding executive director who had led the organization for eight years. Uh, at the end of last year. So as I learned sort of everybody's names, pandemic hit. And uh, so in terms of my entry point, I have a very system level view of things uh, coming from economic development background, uh, having led state agency for um, innovation uh, based economic development and uh, having had startup experience in the tech world I'm very much into looking at um, nonprofit uh, enterprise as value-based uh, mission and uh, looking for sustainability and collaboration, which I think nonprofits are kind of pitted against each other sometimes. And so uh, one of the, so what Food Shift does is that we take recovered food uh, or we actually recover food from food generators and then we bring it to food consumers, so people who are in need of food. And we don't stop at that because we don't believe that lack of food is the cause of hunger in this, in this country. It's not like we're living in the middle of nowhere that doesn't produce food. We have plenty of food, it's just not distributed correctly. And the reason that they don't have access to food is because of financial circumstances. So it's, we believe that having bringing financial security is food justice. And then we can't stop at that. We need to look at food sovereignty. And so we sit in the cross section of intersection of climate change and uh, food waste slash hunger slash food justice. And what we do then is to uh, train people with the food that we recover on how to transform the about to be wasted food into caterable meals. And we generate income through that catering uh, process service, uh, social enterprise kitchen, and we pay the people that, um, that help us save the food and transform the food. And uh, we, sell it at market rate for corporate corporations uh, or individuals and, uh, and then some reserved at cost or below cost for organizations who, who could use the food, the meals. Of course, with COVID, we pivoted to recovering food mostly because we sat, we figured out what we needed to do. There were plenty of people with kitchens or restaurants closing down that they wanted to help make the meals. It's much more gratifying to make the meals and give it to somebody. Uh, but we, what we realized was that with pen, the pandemic, the food supply chain was disrupted. So the food supply chain is fragile. It was not meant to be resilient. It was meant to be very efficient and uh, provide food at the cheapest cost. And so what happened to the soup kitchens was that they needed to scale up their operations, but they ran out of the budget for food to buy the ingredients or their donations ran out. And so, and it was too hard to make broker new partnerships during the pandemic because everybody else was saying like, we need to have fewer people receiving it so that we can control our operations. So for example, uh, San Francisco uh, produce market had asked us to pick up food on behalf of other organizations because they wanted to limit the number of people coming into their facility. So what Food Shift did was we had um, focused on food recovery and we came up with this COVID relief operation called Operation Together. We bring together the food generators and connect them with the food consumers and we distribute the, the overlooked uh, food to divert. Um, I think in the panel, 
before us, they didn't mention how important food waste is as a contributor to climate change. People assume that because food breaks down, it's okay. But as you heard, um, breaking down of food actually causes methane, which is much, much more powerful in terms of capturing heat uh, so than CO2. And people also assume that composting is sufficient. You know, I compost, so I'm not gonna feel guilty about wasting food, um, but it's not the best and highest use. And so food, when we waste it, uh, by the way, it's 40% of food we produce in the US is actually wasted, 40%. Um, and in creating that 40% of food that we waste, we've tied up 20% of drinkable water, 19% of fertilizers, and a whole bunch of other things, not to mention labor, not to mention the land that we have to clear to produce that food. So if you just wanted to not waste food and therefore we can reduce the footprint of the land that we need to clear for our, our needs, um, it will be better. And so by wasting food, we damage uh, you know, many layers of climate action. So, uh, so that's why we're in this. And we want to do this, um, as other speakers mentioned, in a just way where we want to bring up uplift the community. So rather than looking at food waste as this negative thing, why don't we use it as a fuel to uplift our community? So that's what we're trying to do. And uh, part of the COVID-19 relief, again, not pandemic is a horrible thing to waste. And so um, because of the hardship, everybody sort of come together. And so we are using that opportunity to, again, for nonprofits to not fight against each other, but rather collectively, we are stronger together and we're using that opportunity to map our eco, uh, food ecosystem and also prepare for Senate Bill 1383, which um, tries to limit the uh, greenhouse, short, uh, greenhouse gases um, from different sources, including food waste. So we are pivoting our training program, not for culinary because every, all the restaurants are out of work and you know, catering is hard, so instead we are doing workforce development for food recovery, because I, I believe that that's gonna be, um, we're gonna uh, experience an influx uh, in need for trained food recovery officers. So that's what we're doing at Food Chip. Thank you so much, Yuka. Um, next we have Jackie Nunez. Hi, my name is Jackie Nunez. I'm the founder of The Last Plastic Straw and now I'm the advocacy program manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition. Um, I started talking about plastic straws about 10 years ago, and really I got, that was my entry point in a, a way that I thought would be a great entry point for a lot of people on this issue. Um, about 10, 11 years ago, what was happening, there was a lot of data coming out about all the plastic in the ocean, right? All the gyres and finding out there's more than just one gyre. And there were, the scientists were getting a lot of, you know, information out, but I'd go to talks and learn about it. And they were just pulling their hair out. We're like, we need behavior change and it's not happening. Um, and I felt, felt the same way too. I live in Santa Cruz, California, and I started volunteering for uh, an organization called Save Our Shores. And with that, you train to be a sanctuary steward. We're, we're right above the Monterey Bay Marine Sanctuary. And so I learned all about the issue and I started leading beach cleanups. Uh, but I was really dejected and felt overwhelmed and thought that, um, you know, it's just, I wanted to turn off the tap really. And cleanup is great, but it's like, a, you know, the analogy we use is there's a, there's a, a spigot going on and overflowing a bathtub and we're mopping it, right? Or we're trying to bail it with a teaspoon. Well, I wanted to shut off that spigot, but I didn't know how. Um, I'm a former river guide and kayak guide. And if you traveled anywhere in the last 10, 15 years, it's exponential, the amount of plastic you're seeing everywhere. And, um, in COVID, and it's no coincidence that uh, now that I've learned all about the issue that uh, you know half of all plastic that's ever been made has been made in the last 15 years. So if you think, wow, this is getting crazy, it's, it's really is getting crazy because what's happening is the fossil fuel industry is shifting uh, their profit into um, making more plastic uh, with this uh, glut of, of fracking uh, fuel that they have right now as we get away from fossil fuels. So that's kind of the forces that we're up against. Um, what I like to say about plastic is that it never was, never will be disposable. And I feel it's, it's quite a crime to, uh, to even uh, serve it as such, because um, it is instant, it's, it's, it is pollution by design. 
And so without any means to really take it back or to do it in a safe way, uh, I think there, there needs to be a lot more uh, regulation and education and, um, and really corporate responsibility in this uh, material. I tell kids all the time that the feedstock for plastic is the toxic waste byproduct of the petrochemical industry. If you think about that, right? And, and so they've created a market for something that they normally would have to dispose of. And now it's taxed to our communities and they're saying, you know, don't litter and recycle. Um, so they've done a good job of, of shifting the, the narrative all this time so that they can continue selling their product. So I was really pleased when in 2014, I became a member of Plastic Pollution Coalition. And just like you just said, what, one of the things as an outsider coming in, I mean, I really called myself a slacktivist turned activist. I was just a river guy, kayak guy, just out there and didn't want to deal. I, I felt politics was something that just a waste of time. I really didn't believe in our system and how it was set up thought it was just so extractive and, and wasteful. Um, but here I am, I'm actually now watching, writing policy and in, <laughs> in, in, in talking to members of, of Congress and, uh, and, and working in my own community and others as far as policy goes. Uh, but one thing I'm learning too is that, and it's maybe to give you guys hope, I, I've seen uh, some of the questions already, is this, um, and, and, and kids have actually really taught me this too. Kids really take this on this issue is that you know, uh, government is not, is not uh, action, right? It's, they're not really taking action. It's the reaction to our action and we need to step, step up, uh, you know, speak up and show up uh, when we can to, to speak because who's got their ears, some of our, our people, policymakers making these changes are, it's just, a, it's really a lot of business people uh, getting their interest in there. So the more that we can speak up and use your voice in whatever way that you can. Um, so I'll just, I'll tell you shortly um, a little bit about a plastic pollution coalition and then we'll get on to Lindsay and get on to the talk, but it's a, it was established in 2009. It's now it's over 1,200 organizations, business and notables, including artists, chefs, athletes, elected officials. We're in 75 countries and six continents. We've got over 13,500 individual members and we're all working towards a world free of plastic pollution and its toxic impacts. So we really do strive to just kind of get this, this broad coalition together and, and work on um, just combined messaging, of advocacy. We, we say that we uh, you know, connect, advocate, and educate. And so that's really what we, we push towards. So um, yeah, we can talk more about that. I see there's a lot of uh, already some plastic questions in the chat, but uh, we'll go on to Lindsay and uh, between her and I, we could probably tag team all those questions. Thank you so much, Jackie. Lindsay Hole's up next. Yeah, um, hi, thanks for having me. Uh, that's really, really inspiring words, Jackie. And I feel the same way that I started in this place. I actually started in healthcare and I'm a surfer and just got really frustrated with the plastic problem. So I uh, started working with Surfrider as a volunteer and they were launching a program called Ocean Friendly Restaurants. And now it's a very big program. Um, but what I found is that when I was offering um, container options to restaurants to transition to more sustainable practices, it was just different shades of bad. Um, we touch a lot on the plastic problem, which is enormous. Um, and while compostables are mostly better, I think uh, uh, this week I was watching the David Attenborough documentary and thinking about all the ag land and, and how much that contributes to deforestation. Um, you know, that ag land is being used to create the compostables in most, in, in most cases. So living a little more simply or um, without uh, a design by uh, pollution by design, I think that is such a, um, a really powerful word because, um, you know, there is no away. And, and certainly we talk a lot of the, um, the downstream effects of uh, single use packaging, especially plastics, which are the most problematic, but um, not necessarily as much about the upstream. And the more that I started to dig and think about the upstream effects of creating a product to be used for on average 12 minutes, that is how much a single use food container is used for. And the amount of miles the product travels, the amount of steps that go into the manufacturing and then best case scenario, the recycling, it's, uh, you know, it's 25 steps all emitting carbon along the way. So um, I decided to go back to school and, and I'm working on my MBA at Berkeley with, with really this problem in mind. And um, 
I wasn't sure if I would find a team to join that was already tackling it. Um, but I kind of looked left and I looked right. And then I had to look in the mirror. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, you know, try to tackle this. So, um, I found a dispatch goods and I do have a couple slides cause I think that visuals are a little helpful in, in talking about our product and what we're doing. So I'll share my screen. So I um, am the founder and CEO of Dispatch Goods. We now have an amazing team of, of, of uh, you know, about five of us that are running this and then some help with uh, driving and dishwashing. But uh, my co-founder, Maya, came up with our slogan, more tasty, less wasty, and I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, but essentially what we're doing is trying to create an infrastructure uh, so that next time you're ordering takeout and delivery, your food looks a lot le less like the, the image on the left and a lot more like the image on the right. And in fact, these are uh, the containers we're using. We use an insulated thermal bag um, and, and everything is uh, reusable. And um, the way that this works is we have done a lot of customer research and how people would um, basically adopt reusables in, in this, this use case, which is in uh, takeout and food delivery. And everyone says, I wanna order it just like I'm ordering it, but with reusables. So we integrate directly into the checkout process. So basically at our partner restaurants, when you're checking out, you'll see a reusable container option and it's a small added fee um, and you can purchase it. And now we, we launch in takeout only, um, but in September we launched with DoorDash. Uh, it's going really well. It was a one restaurant pilot and now they want to expand. We're just waiting on our next inventory. So uh, DoorDash is really excited um, because of the fact that people use their purchasing power to prove that there is a market for this. And I think that that's what all of us can do. All of us have purchasing power and we can make those conscious decisions. And, and that's what we call it on the community for is we knew this was a test for DoorDash to evaluate whether they wanted to invest resources with this program with us. And, and luckily we had a great turnout. And so, um, so we'll be moving forward on expansion. So you'll be able to purchase a reusable option when you're checking out and then notifies the restaurant to package your uh, container or your food in reusable containers. We use stainless steel and silicone um, and then some mason jars. Um, we try to stay away from plastic. We have one lid that's plastic on our, our basically our pizza container just because we haven't been able to find a steel or aluminum option yet, but I hear there's some development there. So we're excited for what's to come. And then it's a thermal bag uh, as well. And then we coordinate with customers via text. So basically, what our goal is to create the infrastructure that's needed for a curbside reusable collection system that's similar to recycling. So this isn't an on-demand, you text us and we come right away. We work on what day will be in your neighborhood and we let you know. Uh, if you're in the mission, your collection day is Monday, you get a reminder the night before and then 15 minutes before the driver is there and you just put out your bag and your reusables and we come collect. And this really helps us create the density that we need to make this system you know, low cost for customers, low cost for restaurants, but also we're very cognizant about the fuel that it takes to drive around, the, drive these routes. And so our goal eventually is to have a, a fleet of electric vehicles um, to help reduce our emissions as well. Um, but it's still better than every person getting in their car and individually returning the containers. So in a big way, this collection infrastructure is a much greener alternative or much more sustainable alternative um, to uh, every individual um, returning the containers to a, a location. So um, we're this, we call ourselves a garbage concierge service. So we are that collection, washing and redistribution arm. And really looking at this problem, we tackled it first with restaurants, but we feel as though it is really difficult for brick and mortars to participate in reuse because that collection piece is the missing link. It's really the reverse logistics. How do you get things from someone's house and back to the company that's providing it? That is the problem. And that is what we're solving. We're not a container company. In fact, we consider ourselves container agnostic. So one of our partners already had their own juice bottles. That's great. You can participate in our system regardless of what containers you're using. Our, our role is to create, again, that like infrastructure that is necessary for us to be able to introduce reuse at scale, which means having a collection system, siphoning off more and more from that recycling bin and um, the compostable packaging products from the, the compost bin and then also from the garbage bin and putting it into a completely circular system that's processed locally, which is another key component to why reuse is, um, 
it's great because it creates local jobs as well as um, the the transportation um, is so much, uh, the tr transportation dis distance is so much smaller. And so our, we offer a membership where you don't have to pay that fee anymore and we come and collect every other week. And this is what we call the dispatch goods fourth bin. So our members actually get a bin and you can put your reusables on before, uh, before your collection day and we come and collect. I grew up in Pickerington, Ohio, where we didn't have a lot of the progressive Bay Area policies that we have here. And I, I looked, when I, started, when I started thinking about this, I looked a lot to Pickerington, where I'm from, and how recycling became commonplace because it was an added cost to households. And this is definitely middle America, you know, middle income earners in, in the community I grew up in. And I noticed a lot of it came from peer pressure from neighbors, not aggressive peer pressure, but almost just the signal of putting out your recycling bin and your neighbor seeing that, oh wow, people in the community are participating in this, I should be participating. And that was uh, purposeful for us to have this actual bin that people can put out so that people can start to see like, wow, people in my neighborhood are participating in reuse. Um, and so that's been an important uh, part of this because um, in combination with education, we do think that there can be a, a shift in kind of social norms that can help really support this movement. Um, and then I just have a, a short slide about our, our DoorDash pilot because I think it's pretty exciting. So our first month was August um, and we weren't partnered with DoorDash yet. Um, and uh, in that month, our, our reusable option was selected and purchased 117 times. Um, so that was more than um, vegan options. It was more than impossible meat. It was more than gluten-free. It was the number one selected modifier on the menu, even in August. And then you move to September when we included DoorDash and we went from 117 um, purchases to 464. This is at a single restaurant. So the amount that we are saving from the waste stream is really, really incredible. And so think about now we can expand this pilot to all of our restaurants in, in San Francisco and we'll be launching in Alameda pretty soon as well. So um, it's really, really cool to see the amount of, of, of containers that are um, being basically avoided from the waste stream based on this. So that's basically what I have, but I'm excited to answer any questions as we get to that portion. Thank you. Thank you each so much. What an inspirational beginning to this workshop. Um, just a little, you know, looking at the time. So we have a full hour together um, before we'll go back to the, the main group and share out um, our findings and next steps. And I know um, we'd like to spend some time where the panel gets to talk with each other. So we're gonna start with that portion. You can continue to put questions into the chat. Um, I think we'll, It'd be nice to have at least like, you know, we can feel this out, but like 15 minutes or a little bit more for the panel to have a discussion amongst themselves. And then we'll get to the looking at your questions and, and fielding those questions to the panelists. Um, and again, I see folks already doing this, um, but as you put questions into the chat, it can be helpful if they're directed to a particular panelist, if you start the message with their name. Okay. Maybe, um, Beth, we can start with the, the question that Ruth asked us to consider, which is, and, and somebody mentioned that they're feeling sort of daunted by this climate change and what can we do? We're just, you know, like one person. Um, so maybe we can talk about specific action items that people can take so they don't feel that they have something that they feel they can do. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, so uh, I forgot to uh, mention in my intro that actually 40%, uh, I mentioned that 40% of food is wasted. It's easy to just blame the corporations, you know, for climate change. But in the food waste case, 40% actually happens at the household levels. So if you think about it, actually, the, the companies are pretty good about not wasting because that's their bottom line. But we tend to be, and we've all been there, we buy too much, um, something falls behind in the refrigerator, we forget it's there, it, it rots and it, we can't eat it. So it turns out 40% and that equates to almost $2,000 per year in terms of how much you're wasting. So that's just like you flushed it down the toilet, $2,000. Um, 
Um, so hopefully that's motivation enough for people and, you know, respecting the farmers, respecting our resources, obviously, but hopefully that's an immediate way you can save money, capture back some of your hard earned money and, um, and address the 40% loss that we see in the households. And there are, uh, I put in the links to share portion, but I can put it in the chat window too. Uh, we are partnering with Stop Waste, which is an Alameda County public agency to reduce uh, food waste among other things. And so they have a link and our food shift site also has a link on how to reduce uh, food waste at home. So we have those techniques. If, and sign up for our newsletter so that you could get, you know, hints uh, throughout throughout the year. Um, I can speak next. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot that you can do as an individual, right? Just kind of, and I always tell people you got, you got to start somewhere and start small. Uh, but also there's a lot going on policy-wise. And what we're finding is, you know, bottom line, my, my brother owns a restaurant and businesses won't self-regulate. I mean, they're, they're, and especially right now, like the, what we're dealing with, um, with restaurants just struggling, um, they're just going to do whatever's going to, they have such a small margin on their, their profit margin. Uh, but time and again, we find that they actually save money going to these reuse systems. It's a tough time with COVID. So a lot of the extra stuff that their measures they're taking. <laughs> what? Oh, anyway. So anyway, so a lot of the measures that we're taking is, you know, is just being kind of thrown out the window in, in some respects. But what I always kind of reiterate when we're talking about this is that really the, the, they haven't really changed anything for COVID for restaurants besides just wearing masks and uh, partitions. The rest is, is, is the standard health code to operate a restaurant. So they have to adhere to these health codes anyways, because of, you know, uh, foodborne um, illnesses or transmission of disease because people are, are in a shared space and, and using shared um, foodware. So all that's already been, uh, that's what they have to do anyways. So it's not such a big thing. So I think a lot of it's just more for show. And uh, like when restaurants go above and beyond, uh, because they're just so afraid. So it's just, I think part of our jobs is to um, help educate them that it's okay. Somebody had written, you know, about bags. Yeah, bags actually, Governor Newsom did this suspension, the temporary suspension at the beginning of COVID when they weren't sure about, uh, you know, how it was transmitted, but it, he had done it. Um, I forget how long the period was, but when it came time to redo it, he did not redo the, um, renew it. So we do have a statewide bag ban right now. And um, so that's back in play. You know, fortunately for me, where I live in Santa Cruz, which I'm just going crazy over right now, our, our city, uh, not our city, but our, our county um, voted to suspend our 25 cent fee for bags. And they claim because of hardship because of COVID, but already we've been doing it for eight years now. We were one of the first ones to have one of these bag bans. And I thought it would be preempted by the state policy, but because we're grandfathered in, they can do that. So we're working to shift that because in the city, they've actually uh, uh, enacted not only a 25 cent uh, uh, fee um, and enforcing the, the, you know, bringing your own bag, but they're also uh, launched even with COVID that uh, we have a fee now for all the food where for all the plastic um, essentials. So. Um, they're slowly phasing that in, but right now it, people, if they get anything to go and there's utensils and stuff in there, it should be a 25 cent fee. So um, yeah, so anyways, and then also if you wanted, uh, someone wrote about a uh, policy and getting involved, we do have the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, which is a, a federal um, uh, a bill that's been introduced and we'll probably be reintroducing it next year. Uh, 2.0 version will be even stronger, but it really, talks about uh, it's the first I think comprehensive bill on plastic pollution that really uh, as Lindsay said from, from like well wellhead to to waste it, it, it covers that whole gamut in the environmental justice issues and everything else involved so I'll put the link to that you can uh, sign on and we're actually looking for sponsors we got 101 
uh, co-sponsors right now, right? It's not a partisan bill, but right now it's mostly Democrats. So you can write to your, um, to your politicians and see who, if you've got any connections, but we just had the 101 sponsor was AOC. She just signed onto it as a, a co-sponsor. And, uh, which I don't know why it took so long, but anyways, um, but yeah, so there's a, there's a bunch you can do. And again, just like you could say, if you wanted to tune into uh, plastic pollution coalition, there's a lot going on in the, in the uh, break free from plastic uh, movement. And, and with our coalition, we're doing webinars. Now we had to shift from uh, some of our in-person events. Uh, we have a newsletter. Um, you can sign up for that. We don't spam people. It comes out once a month and you can get all the latest and greatest and be on top of that and see, you know, where it is that you'd want to participate in this. There's so much to do here. So I'll stop there. I can piggyback on that. Um, especially there's other questions about how restaurants are getting involved. Um, so uh, I, I completely agree with Jackie that there is a portion of restaurants that are, are not going to participate in circular systems until there's um, policy. Um, we generally have had the best success with people messaging their restaurants and saying they want dispatch goods because customer or restaurants do not want to lose customers right now. And so that really helps move the needle. We have Instagram posts a lot that say tag a restaurant in your neighborhood that you'd like to see on the dispatch goods platform that gets us our funnel of restaurants that we will um, uh, uh, go up and talk to and, and our conversion rate is much higher. You know, for us, we try to price match the single use products um, for it, for us. It's pretty we can um, confidently price match compostables with some of the single use packaging. It's so cheap. It's really difficult for us to do that. Um, so plastic is super problematic from that lens. And, you know, we have a bit of an echo chamber because we work with the restaurants that respond to us. So we're like, restaurants are great and they want to do this. And then we did some um, kind of kind of a cold um, popping into restaurants last week and it went about half of them very receptive and then a, a major um, restaurant in the mission um, told us that if people didn't like plastic then they can cook at home and that they had no intention of moving away from plastic until they were forced to because their margins now that they've moved to 100% takeout and delivery are better than they've ever been. So the other thing is the restaurants that are that are really thriving in COVID and producing the most waste like I think that there's this perception that a lot of restaurants are struggling. There's a certain portion of restaurants that are struggling, especially fine dining places, especially restaurants that cater to the downtown lunch crowd. But there's another portion that are really liking this shift to takeout and delivery because now they don't have overhead costs for um, their employees that serve to customers. And, and so I think we should pass policy um, as quickly as possible. It's a bit of a chicken egg problem. Uh, we work a lot with, with San Francisco and, and the East Bay policymakers because they want us to be successful so they can point to us as a solution <laughs> and it helps us be successful if there is policy. Um, so things that can be done, uh, with the hearing that was for the, for the policy that was going through before COVID and it's been paused and is now being kind of rewritten. Um, you know, it was a pretty low turnout at the hearing. And it was a lot of restaurants and Fisherman's Wharf that cater to tourists that said that if they had a 25 cent fee on containers, then tourists would never want to come to San Francisco anymore. And so that those were the loudest voices in the room. And and it was, you know, a group of us that are in reuse that, that came out to, to fight the case for why this needed to be policy. But when I was, uh, um, you know, in Hawaii and running Surf Riders Ocean, Ocean Friendly Restaurant Program, we were battling uh, styrofoam and we had the room, it was pouring out the door. And I just want to see that type of activism in the Bay Area when it comes to the hearings, um, because it really is the 20 people in the room, those are the voices that are heard. Um, and so calling helps, emailing helps, but really being present for those hearings is what I've seen to be the most effective at making it so abundantly uh, apparent that the status quo is not acceptable the large majority of consumers want to shift away from these wasteful practices and, and the voices need to be heard. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of my two cents on, on the restaurant uh, positions, but you know, truthfully for us, we try to keep it the same um, price for restaurants. And, and if there's, you know, people in the Bay area, a great way to get involved is to just talk to your restaurants about uh, reuse and, and, and connect them with us. And I put my email in the chat. So. Well, so I guess that leaves me. And um, 
one thing that we're noticing in our work <clears throat> is the way that personal use of food, um, or in our case, just our organization's use of food is really a part of a big, a much larger system. So I think that we all need to think really carefully about how we purchase our food. I think if you are more thoughtful, you spend more money on more locally and thoughtfully produced food, you will be less, waste, less wasteful. Um, and in our own work, we see a lot of food waste coming to us. Um, and you know that's one way to help reduce it. But in the end, I don't think that's super sustainable or the exactly the right way to be thinking about food waste. And so we're gonna to try to get more involved in the conversation about um, how food is produced in general and what's the right kind of food um, for the work we're doing. And we're feeling very strongly that people who are food insecure should not be relegated to a second tier food system, that we want actually to take a much more holistic look at how we source our food and how it goes out to our clients. Um, uh, we're just beginning to think this through, but we're just recognizing more and more how the food system in this country is very broken and how um, it favors people who can afford to buy healthy food. Uh, our clients cannot afford to buy healthy food and the kind of unhealthy food that's available to them is not is highly subsidized, not sustainably produced. So how do we kind of break through that and try to find ways to ensure that people, all people have access to the best kinds of foods um, and that it's produced in a less wasteful way. Um, that includes things like packaging, which we're really always confronting, right? Is these highly processed foods that are packaged um, in unsustainable ways again. Um, so we want to start looking at, um, I think Yuka brought this up earlier, just it's really important to see the whole picture, think um, through where you want to fit into that big picture and how you want to just move into a space where we're thinking about um, ju justice in terms of food and a sustainability or regenerative kind of approach to how food is produced and then made available to people. Um, seems like a super hard question, but we feel like we're really well positioned to um, kind of look at that intersection between individual use of food and the bigger food system. And then how do you just make it just for everyone? And I actually had a thought about um, Lindsay's work and how, because this is something that we've been thinking about a lot. We do, we package our meals in supposedly com compostable um, containers. We actually work with the city of Berkeley to ensure they're as compostable as possible. But um, we really liked the idea of reusable containers for some of our clients, but we weren't really sure how to incentivize the return of the containers. So I think that would be a, you know, another way to add in a kind of individual responsibility um, to the conversation. Like how do we make what you're doing accessible to everyone regardless of their income level? Yes, yeah, Sarah, I think that's a great point. Um, you know, maybe Lindsay and, and uh, Sarah and I could talk offline on how to get this, not just to the individuals, but to organizations that are serving food to make sure that we're using uh, if not compostable, reusable. And um, I, we, for one, when we contract with our clients, um, we give them our trays, you know, the, the restaurant trays that are reusable, that, that, that are in our kitchens. And so they know to give it back to us because otherwise they're not gonna get the next tray of food. Um, but yeah, for sure. And Sarah, thank you for mentioning the sort of the justice equity diversity and inclusion lens, there is, um, I've come to know that there is a lot of white supremacy being practiced in um, the food, the feeding um, areas, programs, and it's not intentional, obviously, we're not bigots, uh, but there are so many things that are done in a way that doesn't honor the people that we are serving, and often it turns into prioritizing the redemption of the givers uh, rather than liberation of the receivers. And so um, I'm so, 
I was so disgusted that this happened that I'm now training not just my staff, but uh, advisors and volunteers. If you're going to volunteer with us, you must go through this onboarding um, program at Food Shift where we go over what I call JEDI, the Justice, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, the JEDI uh, overview session, uh, because I don't want anybody thinking that we're doing this for our own redemption, which, you know, we'd like to feel good about volunteering and, and doing our work, but that can't be at the expense of the people. Like at the end of our interactions, they must have gotten into a better place um, than we started. And just feeding people, just delivering meals doesn't necessarily do that. They're just going to be hungry four hours after. And so we can't just be patting our shoulders um, based mm -hmm. on that. So, um, and even like Sarah said, like the, the food, there's attitudes that, that, you know, oh, poor people don't like fresh produce. It's like, where did we get that narrative? <laughs> it's too expensive. That's where it came from. Exactly. And so, you know, who are we to be like wagging our fingers to say like, well, they don't, they eat too much sugary foods or whatever. And so. But that's yeah. the cheapest food. These. And exactly. So it's the system that made it that way. And so why are we blaming the people? I'm fond of saying, you know, we got to fix the system, not the people. We're not broken. And so, uh, so yeah. Yeah. And you guys hit on a few you know, really good points that I think is just kind of like the, the bigger picture. And when you're talking about the systems, it's, it's a big system shift that we're talking about from everything, the packaging and food. And I really believe when people ask me like, well, what do you think the, the solutions will be? It's, it's, it's going to be regional. The solutions are regional. And so if you have the food is, is being um, transported uh, from like a hundred mile radius, whatever, like the local yeah. food systems, you know, the food's going to be fresher, right? It's going to have higher nutritional content. Um, so people are going to get the nutrition they need. Right now, the, the food that's being um, in this industrialized food system, is, is, it really has, it's full of preservatives, full of all these chemicals. It's, um, you know, it's packaged like crazy. And, and it's so, and it is a, a food justice, uh, environmental justice issue for sure and access. And, and uh, you, you, you actually um, pointed to a few things too that you find we're really shifting away from this narrative, um, like the savior thing, right? It drives me crazy when I hear as, a, as an activist and, and working towards change, uh, warring words, um, you know, and, and this 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 uh, militarization of our activism, um, and really that's kind of the problem, right? I mean, it's not a, it's not a fight for some people. It is a fight for survival. I totally acknowledge that, and and su and support their fight in, in any way I can. But um, it it is an in inclusive type of a, a problem that we really need to look at. And um, it's you know we're all the heroes. It's not like anyone. We need everyone kind of on deck. To, to help solve this problem. Um, we, we did uh, sponsor, or we're one of the, the coordinators for uh, a great conference called Unwrapped last year. And uh, it was in the Santa Cruz uh, Hills. And we had people from all over the world, scientists that are working on chemicals in, in plastics and, and, uh, and how, and particularly food packaging. And so I've got um, a link here in the, the chat and you can take a look at the, um, you know, the website for that and they had a declaration. So basically, you know, the, basically the declaration from that conference was that there's real cause for concern about a lot of the packaging we're using um, to uh, transport our food. And it was really eye-opening um, for these scientists. And, and just so you know, like there's, there's uh, organizations like the Plastic Soup Foundation, which is part of our coalition. They have a, a health coalition that um, we're looking to be um, partners with or supporting partners um, in, in the EU because they've got stronger um, regulations on chemicals, right? You have to prove that it's innocent before putting it out for most chemicals. They've got a huge list where we've got only a handful and we have to prove that it's guilty, right? So we're the long-term testing. Um, so it's really great. We're really excited to be you know, uh, working with um, the Plastic Soup Foundation and this this health coalition in Europe because they are moving forward with the EU and there's just so much more studies being happening and it's not studies by uh, by industry, right? They're they're subsidized. There's scientists working on this and it's not looking good. You know, I think my my brother said it best. He's not a um, 
what I would call an environmentalist or anything, but he said, uh, after learning more about it from me, he said, you know, we're going to find that plastic is the lead of our generation. And it was this you know, wonderful material that we added to everything, but um, it's, it's turning out to be not so good. I mean, if you think about it, it's a mix of chemicals and it's the toxic waste byproduct of the petrochemical industry is what the feedstock is for 99% of this plastic. So we really need to shift away from all this. And, and uh, Sarah, I appreciate you using the words, um, you know, uh, regenerative and resilient. And, you know, this, this, this word of sustainable, right, sustainability, uh, is being really overused right now and corporations like to co-op that but it's like sustain what i don't want to sustain this the status quo we had a question in, in the chat about cleanup of the ocean that's great but again it's that analogy of the tap we need to it, you know any any kind of measures that you're going to have um to uh you know clean up our environment of this then in basically our bodies um has to start with a reduction a source reduction and to take away these subsidies uh, that that these industries are getting, and even you know for for food as well, that it needs to be um, put into the right regenerative type of technologies and systems that are actually going to serve the whole, and not just a few. So that's kind of where we're at. It's actually it's it feels like a daunting time, but to me it feels like um, an exciting time to be involved in any of this work um, because the shift needs to happen. COVID's really highlighting all the things that aren't working with our system right now. And so this is opportunity, like when we reopen, when we go back to, you know, what we call normal, there's going to be a big shift. There's going to be a big shift, even like how we consume food every day. And I think we were very wasteful in our consumption and our waste of, of, of even food. And, um, and, and in a lot of these, these systems that we're a part of. So, uh, and even for us as activists, like, you know, it's great to go to conferences and everything. But, you know, I, there were times where I was like, Jesus, I, I, I traveled so much last year. And it's like the, the, you know, here we are trying to save the planet, but our, you know, we're, our, our plane with, you know, in all the, what we're doing to the atmosphere. So I think that's going to be that the new normal will be this combination of, of, of these kind of conferences. I think there is a value of having in-person um you know, meetings, but I think it's going to be a combo. And I think that what that does too, it, it creates more access to people because you know, even me as a, you know, grassroots organizer, I was never um, privy to a lot of these conferences um, until the, the plastic straw blew up in, in our thing, then I was being invited. But, um, but I could never afford that, even though I was really interested in what was going on in this realm. Um, so I think it's going to be this great kind of shift that needs to happen in basically everything we do. Um, and it's not going to be, when people get freaked out, I, I think it's going to be more abundance. Like people think it's scarcity. I think right now, the way that we're doing our food system and everything, that's scarcity. Um, and it really is abundance when we get more local, the money stays local, uh, everybody wins, um, except for those corporations that are profiting off of uh, sickening our planet and this extractive model of disposability and, and waste. So one thing I really hate about my area of work is that this idea that, well, we just need to get food, any food to people who are hungry. And so it doesn't matter where it's produced, how it's produced, um, if people really want it. And it ends up creating, it, so it's this really big problem, very, um, systemic problem, but, you know, like just, I'm going to say something that probably shouldn't, but, you know, feeding America is a model of how we kind of a corporation that doesn't pay its workers enough and then forces them to use food assistance is also actually supporting the food assistance um, community, that whole industry. I mean, um, Andy Fisher wrote a book called Big Hunger, and he likens this whole system to something um, like, you know, other big industries, big ag, um, for instance, and, and big hunger fits, slot, you know, just slots right in there. And I, I just think it's super important to rethink the whole system. Like, why are people not getting enough food? Um, because they're not being paid enough, because housing is too expensive. There's all these other factors that need addressing. And at the same time, we need to address the whole food system. Like we have uh, an entirely second tier food system 
that feeds people who are hungry. And it's a wasteful system. Um, and it involves tons of transportation from out of the country, um, food that's grown in the US being sent to China for producing, for processing and um, then shipped back. When those are the kinds of jobs that people might want, you know, if um, in this country that would keep them from being hungry. Um, I mean, it used to be the case that people who worked in food processing could support themselves. So I, I really think it's so important, like all these other issues, like looking at plastic as this holistic problem, it's, you know, the waste from petrochemical industry. Um, it, it's kind of become de facto for everything. People, most people hardly think about it. Um, and so it's really just something we have to look at from all angles, like how do we, slow down the production? How do we find better alternatives? How do we manage the waste? I think it's the same with the food too. It's like really stepping into a systemic, a conversation about a broken system. Maybe we can gonna, take Steve's question since he's had his hand up for a while. Yeah, I was gonna say we could transition. I know um, the panelists have been responding to some of the questions in the chat, but maybe we can sort of move towards um, the Q and A. And just to check in with folks, uh, my sense is that maybe we can stay all together as a group because I feel like there's some interesting conversations happening between um, plastics concerns and food waste. And uh, if if folks have a strong feeling that you would like to break into smaller groups, um, we can see about that. I think it seems like there's a, a lot of generative conversations happening all together. So I would I would maybe advocate for for that um, unless panels in particular feel like you might have something to gain by meeting in smaller groups. Okay, so we'll stay together. We have 30 more minutes together and we can start addressing more specifically the questions. And for folks, um, you're, you're welcome, as we've already mentioned, to um, write your questions into the chat. If you would like to verbally you know, ask a question, you can put a hand up. And like Yuka said, Steve's had his hand up for a while. So Steve, you can go to your question. Okay, can you hear me? Can, can yeah. you hear me? Yeah, okay, great. All right. Uh, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I haven't had a lot to do with uh, Zero Waste for some years, but I, I was the, the person who started the Measure D campaign in Alameda County 30 years ago. And uh, so, so I knew Ruth Abbey when she was a noob. And, uh, the, um, uh, and I spent four years on the County Recycling Board also. So a little bit of a background on that, but here, here's, the, here's the thing that bothers me all the time uh, in, in this regard, and that is, you know, whenever I go by any kind of residential, uh, you know, waste can or dumpster, you know, anything like that, it's a disaster. Um, you know, we're, we're not getting the source separation, and, and part of it, you know, people have a lifelong habit, uh, you know, but honestly, the, I mean, the, the whole point of doing Measure D those, those years ago was to uh, get a recyclables collection, and then later on, compost got added. And at that point, I kind of thought, hey, we're off and running, and, and we're kind of not off and running. Um, it's just sort of a train wreck. Um, and I just wanted to see if the panelists or, or anybody else uh, has any uh, particular insight to that. I mean, other than that, it, it's, it's a long, hard grind. <laughs> To clarify, Steve, you're saying that we're not doing residents are not doing a good job separating out the recycling. Well, not just food. residents; it's commercial too. Oh, Marshall. Okay. Yeah, uh, you know, and and I mean, probably the worst is multifamily, uh, because people often, you know, they they're talk, they talk their stuff down the chute, and that places everything in an even larger remove, you know, and it just isn't, you know, uh, and, and so I so whatever we've been doing kind of isn't working. Um, and so I, I realize that, that none of you are exactly in that particular uh, area of work, but uh, it, it's something we all know about, you know. So I just uh, was wondering if you had any insights. I could speak a little bit to this, and I see uh, Luis has her hand up. I don't know if this is a, a reply to him, maybe no more. Um, yeah, I, I think you somebody wrote something. Um, but I, you know, I was just actually in a, uh, webinar yesterday and, um, we had someone, uh, speak and she was from the, um, 
let me see right. It was Susan V. Collins, and she was from the uh, uh, Recycling Container Institute. And and yeah, I mean, the biggest problem that we did is that when we put the mix recycling, right? I mean, it's uh, that's a big problem right there. And the the amount of actual um, you know usable or actually viable plastics or any kind, even glass or metal, it was just so contaminated. And uh, she spoke mainly about um, the deposit systems for bottles and how effective that was. And, uh, and then even furthermore, um, these places where they had uh, breweries and restaurants, all part of a co-op and like in Oregon and Montana, where they they had winemakers and, and breweries all together and they were, they were refilling bottles, not recycling them um, and, and keeping it you know, fairly local. Uh, again, I think the answers are going to be regional, right? I mean, they used to do that with our soda. We used to have, uh, uh, you know, these, these soda fountains and you had the, 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 the Coca-Cola or Pepsi guy come and fill that up and you had the bottles and, um, and they're doing that in Europe and it, it's just really effective. So those are some of the, the systems and, you know, Arthur uh, Bloom um, kind of gave me a schooling on the history of, of just kind of recycling in this country. And, uh, you know, he did kind of break it down. There are the, the ones that are doing better or, or have been historically doing better are the grassroots recycling um, uh, type of uh recycling systems that are set up and, and we're fortunate enough to have that in Berkeley and stuff. And that's why that's still kind of viable and we're still able to move on these composts and different things, but it's still, like you said, it, it's not perfect. And um, the big elephant in the room is that other, uh, the other systems are like waste haulers, right? So they still have the old system. And so they actually are pushing like some of these places in the East, East coast, I know Vermont, there's a, a conflict of interest. They would rather um, just, you know, haul it and not bother with recycling anymore and just throw it all in the dump because they're going to be getting all the money. And so there's a cash cow. Exactly. So this is like a huge system shift. I remember taking a three day recycling class. The Recology Center was so eye opening, but I was so dejected at the end. I'm like, oh my God, like this is a whole shift and you know I, I come from back east and some of that stuff is you know some of these haulers man it's mafia or historically mafia so you're like mm -hmm. wow you know like what is happening here so it's a big um shift but I, again i think that when we have these these communities that really want to to make an effort and these um towns uh and and have these systems you can make it happen um and we have to, our, our landfills are overflowing and everything. There's a lot of hands up right now. So I'm gonna stop talking. Maybe mm -hmm. someone else wants to chime in. Um, Beth, um, do you want to cho think, choose them? Yeah, I think maybe Matt, Matt has his hand up and then we'll move to Louise after that. And I know I saw also Matt has a question in the chat. I'm not sure if that's the same question or a new question, but Matt, why don't you? Um, I, I've worked in the food business, both on the uh, natural and organic side. Um, and then more recently in, in uh, catering over at the Presidio. And I think, you know, there's a ton of valuable information that everyone's sharing, but the, I think the last time uh, I looked at this metric, about 90 cents out of every dollar went to one of 10 companies. You know, the usual suspects going from uh, some of the poultry processors to package good grocery processors. Um, so one of the things I hear everybody talking about on the local level is really great, but I guess I'm wondering is where and various participants have talked about this in terms of actually having mandates, but is extended producer responsibility, anything that's being uh, actively explored or investigated or mandated on any municipal levels requiring companies like Amazon or Ikea, et cetera, to pay however it would be worked out fees associated with either the packaging and or product end use uh, disposal. That's the part that I think could be the real sort of uh, uh, fertilizer for all these amazing things all the participants have talked about. And I was curious if anybody had any info on that area. Yeah, I mean, that's a big component of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. And that's probably going to be the stickler that's going to, you know, as far as industry, the lobbyists coming after it as well. 
Um, but we have it in there because that is part of the, um, you know, the solution to the problem. There needs to be producer responsibility for that. We're also looking at, um, regardless or not, whether it, we'll see how the, the current, the federal uh, political system shifts uh, come November, but uh, regardless, we're looking also of, you know, doing versions or aspects of the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act on the state level. Um, we'll probably have some governors and we'll, we'll be looking at it for California, of course, and some of these other states that are uh, really moving forward on some of these issues. And then, you know, locally, there's a lot of power there too. Um, but what we're doing with the reuse network is uh, working towards um, opt-in options for a lot of the, uh, uh, right now it's food. Uh, so as far as the Amazon thing goes, um, uh, there are some Amazon campaigns that we're a part of as well, as far as eliminating uh, packaging and having that, that option. So people can say, I don't want all this plastic packaging and, and having, and it does have to start regardless of how many, um, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people that Amazon is shipping for. Um, it does start, there are the, the main warehouses and if it starts there, then they can really uh, have it. So there's a few, yeah, there's actually a lot of different aspects of the, of the uh, campaigns for that. And um, some are direct actions and others are definitely, that's always a component of a lot of our uh, policy. It has to be. Um, and not to be just a follow up. I think there's maybe 14 states that now have bottle redemption bills. So, um, you know, it becomes if we can't even charge people two and a half cents for a bottle, I, I guess um, I'll shut up now because I'm being like really negative, but I'm really challenged on the back end legislative element and where, you know, a jobs program with mandated uh, bottle bills, et cetera, could be coordinated. Um, but anyways, I'm just, uh, I'm going to mute myself now. and <laughs> take, uh, take Matt, thank you for sharing your frustration, because I think mm -hmm. it's not, I don't, I think we need to, we need to stay in that space sometimes, you know, without that negativity, we won't have this, um, urge to do something about it so mm -hmm. I will let you know that plastics and f food waste have things that are similar um, with regards to what Jackie said about you know you, you used the word Jackie regional I used the word hyper local you know because like you said it's like the neighborhood soda shop that used to like grab your bottles back and that's exactly how it should be with the food system where <laughs> A lot of the food practitioners, you know, the, the big folks, you know, the, the established food banks and and the system that kind of runs on like its sustainability, its organizational sustainability relies on having poor people needing food from mm -hmm. them. And um, they <coughs> catch all the folks. They don't know where the houses, you know, encampments are. They don't know, you know, like, you know, it's like, come, we, we've had this come and get it. And so I'm pleased by some policies now being drafted or have recently gone into play like the Senate Bill 1383, where they are trying to incorporate not just a top-down policy, but recognizing that for it to work, there's got to be bottom-up implementation that needs to be coordinated. And they're trying to do that. I don't know if it's going to be successful you know, the, the way it's written, but I know that on the implementation part, we're trying our best to live up to the spirit of the policy and have as much collaboration as possible. Um, but I think food generators, plastic mm -hmm. generators, packaging generators, the fact that there are now policies around shifting that responsibility, not to the consumers, but to the producers, I think it's a big shift and I know that's like a small step in terms of like, we have a long ways to go, but I think that mind shift is, is profound. And I, you know, and if we can talk to, I'm, I'm sorry to see some of the, the policy uh, makers leave the room, but you know, I, I, if I had something to let them know, it's like, please make sure in every policy that you make that 
it's not just top down that he, that you consider implementation policies and yes the shifting of the responsibility to those who are making money off of it like who benefits you know and just having asking that simple question who benefits and then crafting a policy around it making sure that the grassroots voices are heard and incorporated in that policy i think is is one that would win because one size does not fit all and I, I think that's what Jackie and Sarah and Lindsay have been saying. And one thing I've noticed about this whole conversation uh, more broadly is that when people demand certain things, um, it's interesting to see how there's a shift on the business end. So for example, people have started saying, I don't want so much plastic packaging when I order something online. And I've just been so, and I make a real conscious effort if I'm going to order something online that hopefully it's locally produced, but also that it's packaged with, you know, old newspapers or something and not the plastic pillows. And, um, and more and more I'm getting products shipped that way. Um, so there is this kind of movement and it's probably very small, but it's demonstrating that it's possible to go back to the old kinds of packaging materials um, because people are asking for them. And so I think that goes hand in hand with the attempt to make um, changes at the bigger levels, more legislative changes too. We can demonstrate that it's something people want. So it's happening at the level of us demanding it. And because we're customers, we get it, but also demonstrating that it's workable at the um, policy level. Um, one other comment about extended producer responsibility and, and why I, for us, that is ideal. I know there's some talk about holding food delivery apps accountable for the amount of waste that they're basically vomiting into our cities. Um, and uh, with extended producer responsibility, you know, I think the pushback we get sometimes is that the costs are just going to be passed on. But for that, for, for us, that's a great thing because right now there's a complete association between the taxpayer subsidies that are basically fueling, paying for the, the actual life cycle of the product and the product itself. And at least the consumer can now see the, the true cost of the, of the container when they're making purchasing mm -hmm. decisions. And that gives us a, 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 a way to be price competitive because it's impossible for us to compete against something when we do take the full life cycle of the container into our cost considerations and what we have to charge, but single use products don't. So until that entire life cycle is built into the cost, which it absolutely should be because ours is, there is no way that we can cost compete. That is how I feel like you make, because mm -hmm. dishwashing is cheap. Dishwashing is cheaper than, than creating a product, but they're, um, but they're just not having to, to actually pay for the full life cycle of the product. So. And it actually uses less water. That's a big misconception oh, yeah. about that, yeah. Yeah. making plastic. But uh, Luis, you've had your hand up for quite some time. I, I feel <laughs> Thank bad. Thank you. Yeah. Well, my, my question goes along with the, uh, the EEXPI because I really do think extended producer responsibility is key. And just the way it's important to do things locally and we need to get this country back into the Paris Agreement, why not get also globally join the Green Dot program, get a, be a part of what's there already. Let's have it be global. Let's have more publicity. Let's get some bills to have a national extended producer responsibility program. Let's get vending machines that re, uh, reverse taking back your uh, bottles and all that they have in Europe. Europe is way ahead of us. People are going along with it. We need to start it. And just having little things here or there is not gonna get us the impact that we need. And I'd like to see us think big as well as local. And I would like to hear if anybody is aware of anything happening nationally to get our country to be a part of this and have a global EPR system out there. Do you, um, do you wanna explain what the Green Dot program is for everybody? Uh, okay, well, the Green Dot yes, program is in, in Europe, companies pay into a program that helps with all this recycling and, and reabsorbing all these packaging issues. And, and in, in exchange for paying, they get the privilege of putting a green dot 
on their products. So when you go out to buy something, you can look for that green dot, just the way we look for things that are, you know, packaged to say they're organic or this or that. People look there for this green dot. And that means the corporations have been responsible. And we should know which companies are responsible. We shouldn't have to go to a website. We, we, we shouldn't have to go to Rainforest uh, in Action to look up what companies are doing terrible things. We need to have a way of identifying the companies that we want to support and that we want to encourage others to join in and be part of being more responsible because I think they've gotten a free ride way too long. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, California Green Dot Program, yes, it would be great, it would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'll look more into it. I'm pretty sure with the Break Free From Plastic movement because we have a lot of members in the EU, we are uh, looking uh, to the EU uh, for a lot of the measures that they're doing, they're ahead of us, like you said, and um, definitely for, for models for that. We have a, a Plastic Pollution Coalition. We have a global legislative toolkit, and we are working with some of the with the UNEP and some of the organizations over there for uh, legislation to just really. It's a better version, so I welcome anyone to get on there and take a look if you know of anything or anything to add. Where it's a basically like a living document for not only policymakers, but activists or anyone working in this, in this field. Um, but we're trying to amass uh, a lot of the best policies um, worldwide. Right now, it's, as you can expect, it's pretty US uh, centric, but we, that's, that's all changing. We've got a lot more stuff in there too. So there's gonna be a lot of um, basically cross, hopefully um, pollination for bet, lack of a better word, um, in some of these programs that we can, can do it. But yeah, great point, Louise. Thank you for what you're doing. And, and, and are you going to uh, develop a committee of people who might want to volunteer to be helping, helping with this? Um, well, you know, as far as Plastic Pollution Coalition, we invite anyone to join us and you, we have a newsletter and you can reach out, but I think it would be probably through, um, we just have to um, find out. I know there's a lot of working group. I'm, I'm actually kind of Zoom burnout at this point. I don't even remember like what group is what. So I have, I'm kind of going through my head of what group would be best. But especially with the Break Free From Plastic movement, we have uh, groups. I'm part of the Clean Seas Coalition with uh, California policy. So we could probably can address it there. Um, also the states and, and US policy for Break Free From Plastic. And then there's also a global. Um, so... Yeah, I'll just, um, I mean, if you're, I, I'll, I'll put my email in the, in the chat if anyone's interested and, um, and I can steer you into whichever ones, you know, people that I think are, are moving in the directions that you guys want to be a part of as well. We'd be happy to do that because we have a, a vast uh, um, network. But you, I also encourage you guys to get on the Plastic Pollution Coalition's website and we have a directory. If you want to look up an organization or whatever, you can see what, what organizations are part of us, what businesses with individuals and um, we just have a, a massive list, but I'll put my email here. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for all the great work you've done yeah. and are doing. Thank you. Thank you. I will do. Kiara, are you ready for your question? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Kiara, um, hand it. Yeah, so I, um, sorry about this, if this has already been covered, I hopped in a little late from one of the other sessions, but I'm curious um, the conversation around, because when I think about, um, Reducing waste, I think there's a lot of movement to try and keep our consumption habits the same and be able to figure out how to transition those to lower impact waste production. So like compostable mailers or whatever uh, versus like the plastic bubble ones that one of the other um, people were talking about. How, what is, what thought is being going, is going into transitioning economic structures so that we actually address the ways that our society consumes to begin with. So thinking about like degrowth economics or thinking about just shifting how much we buy in general, not just to make everything that we buy zero waste. That is a great question. I think that's harder as, I mean, we can't even get our population to wear masks when we know that that's like the cheapest thing we can do to, to uh, help ourselves and our neighbors. So um, I think that's uh, in this country, I think, you know, leadership matters uh, to try to set a different norm 
uh, certainly, and then from the top down. And then I think as you know, Jackie and Sarah and Lindsay have been saying, I think it's things start hyper local, like even Black Lives Movement, you know, Matter Movement. It's like before we point fingers at different, you know, structural um, forces in the law that's discriminating and um, you know, all of that, all the racism, power, powerism, you know, sexism, all of that. Um, what are we doing? What are we doing in our own households? What are we doing in our own organizations where, where we can set policies? And I think a lot of us don't know that we've act, you know, we've unknowingly been not inclusive. And so uh, I think that's, for me, that's, that's what I do is to take a look at my practice and, and then model it and then build it into my little area that I have control over and, and then see like if, if our partners, you know, we offer our Jedi training to our partners as well um, because we want to keep, in, keep viewing a sense of ourselves beyond our own skin and so, I mean, that sounds maybe cheesy to say, but I, I think we got to start somewhere. And for us, it's, I know what I can control. I lead this organization. If I have influence over the partners that we have, you know, I'm going to choose to work with people that we can develop these similar uh, values together and practice. So um, it's a good and important question that we should all be thinking about. How can we modify our own behavior. And I don't think they're values if they're not willing to sacrifice something for it. So. Yeah, and I, I think it's really difficult to um, deal with that sort of co-optation thing that happens within our economic system. So, you know, you have um, organic farming was taking off and a lot of small farmers were really sustaining it. And then agribusiness took it on and they sort of turned it into something different. They, they lost the spirit of what organic um, uh, farming was, and, but people find it really easy to buy all the lakeside produce, for instance, um, rather than the local farmer. So it's, I feel like it's this constant battle to really keep the message clear and um, the true spirit of the work that we're all trying to do and not let it get sucked up into a larger economic system that we live in. Um, that's to my mind, the really hard part. So I agree with Yuka that you can really start small and, and model and you know preach your beliefs, but it's always hard to um, work within the system we live in right now. Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of my things, I, I talk to children a lot, and that actually gives me hope. <laughs> when I talk to adults, it's like, shoot me now. Um, when we've been indoctrinated into this system, and so we've been marketed to that this is convenient, that this is it. And so everything is built upon this, all this fossil fuels and this whole structure around it. And so part of dismantling that is you have to, I always say, you have to start with yourself. You got to clean your own house before you can clean anyone else's. And, um, and that's what I, I tell kids all the time. I mean, look at yourself, look at your home. You know, what is it that maybe we can change? And I know it's not just us, it, there is this bigger forces, but I, I really wanted to move towards, you know, thinking of ourselves that we are not, I want, I'm a citizen, I'm not a consumer but we're, we're talking and, and even our, our natural systems are, are talked about as resources, right? I mean, to get away from this extractive uh, economy, which I think is, is a failed economy. I mean, it, it can't continue. There's not, there's no resilience in that or regenerative. I mean, there's nothing, there's no waste in nature and, and we are part of nature and we are just, you know, shooting our own foots into extinction with the way that we are going about our, um, you know, how we're making money and, and what is money is just the tool. And so, I mean, this is insane, right? What we're doing. So it's, it's, it is a system shift and it really the, the place to be one of my favorite African problems. And I'll probably, I'll just subphrase it because I'll probably mess it up, but basically you do what you can with what you have and the time that you have and the place that you are. And, and that's what I go back to. And I do feel like, and, and I, I would be a great testament to that. Just choosing the plastic straw, starting 
in my own hometown as a crazy straw lady and then having it go, but it's, I feel like that was the pebble in the pond. Right. And then the, the, the waves went out and now they're coming back like, you know, tenfold. Right. I mean, I always knew it would be more of a movement and I knew it was just, I, I really believe that no one sets out to pollute the planet. We're just not aware. And so to just be able to have that entry point, that way to, to just bring that awareness and, and open that up for people. Um, I had it, it was never really about the plastic straw. It was about plastic for single use. And my mission statement doesn't even say the word plastic in it. You know, it's about the raising awareness about the absurdity of single use plastic and eliminating it from, you know, our, our, our lives basically you know, from our environment and from polluting. So, you know, I used to say it was the gateway issue because people would learn about it and I go, oh my gosh, what else am I doing? And what about the bottles? What about the, you know, utensils? And it really did kind of start this conversation but now I'm calling it the key of the door. The door's open, right? And everyone's in the room talking about plastic and these systems and, you know, and, and waste and you know, in terms of zero waste and, and, and all these things. So the conversations are having, and this is the real work now. You know, I feel like all 10 years of work, I mean, that was just all about, hey, you know, waking people up. And now the real work happens, which I'm really excited about too, is, is this system shift that we need. Um, and, you know, I think, for plastic, that's the tangible thing people can see. It to me, it's like I call it the physical embodiment of climate change. It's like the one thing you can see; it's in our faces. And an industry is working really fast to try to um, make that disappear, but in a way to just basically uh, the false solutions of recycling and 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 chemical recycling or waste to energy. Um, and, ba and and what that is is a transfer of po pollution to pollutants. So it's not going away. It's becoming more of a pollutant in our environment and rather than deal with the fact that we are just totally abusing our resources and, 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 our, uh, and what we are valuing right now. Um, and it's not, it's, you know, nobody wins with that. So I just feel hopeful that everybody wins when we really kind of look at the, the systems and, and uh, work towards something. That's why, I mean, as much as talking about policy and businesses, it's always good to be it's talking more in positive, inclusive terms. And so you say, hey, let's, let's pilot this. Why don't you try it? You know, I mean, everybody's just so well, I'm caught up in it, but really it's like, well, let's just pilot this and, and talk about things like, you know, um, well, this isn't working. Why don't we work towards something that works? You know, because they'll see that there are things that aren't really working for them either. And, you know, and Lindsay talks about these, these businesses that are making all this money. There's a lot of businesses spending a lot of money on this to go crap more so than they ever did. And, and it is about profit margins and maybe they're not employing as many employees or whatever. And that's where they're doing their costs. Um, but there should be consequences to that. And there is a real cost to it. And that's what I love about having at least a 25 cent fee. Cause people are like, what? I was like, well, it never was free. You know, you are paying for it. There is a cost to this. And if we can get away from these subsidies and, and stop subsidizing these polluting industries, then we're on it. So there's just so many levels of that, but there's also really just, you know, as with anything, you need to, you know, one foot in front of the other. Um, and, you know, there's a, a quote that I have right here that I always look at from Howard Zinn. And um, the last line of it is, is if we do act in however small way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is infinite succession of presence. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. And that's Howard Zinn. And I just think that, you know, I looked at that every day and it really helps me get grounded and think about the work that needs to be done. And it's, it's all of us. Um, I'm going to jump in here and just say that we're about out of time. Um, 1130 is our chance to go back to the main plenary. I put a link to that. Um, it's the room we started in, the different Zoom room. Um, but before we go, just really want to thank our four generous panelists who um, just have modeled so many um, pioneering uh, innovations and, and our models for, for steps that we can take. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great questions. Good conversation. Yeah, thanks everyone for participating. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Thank you, Beth.